So, yeah. All right. So, thanks. Okay. So, as everybody knows, probably, I'm an ecological economist. An ecological economist, we're focused on, you know, um, real production, real systems. Mainstream economics focuses on widgets, you know, some anonymous economic thing. Ecological economics focuses on essential resources. And the most essential these is food. So I want to focus on food. If an economic system is going to get anything right, it's got to be the allocation of the most important resources. So to begin with, though, I want to um, start out just a question for all of you. What economic system are you raised in? Probably neoclassical. So neoclassical, so market economy. Any other, the, any other, uh, Capitalism. Capitalism. <laughs> um, so these are the, this is what people typically say. But if you think about it, you were raised in a family in uh, what I call the core economy. It's the, the ability to reproduce our social system, our cultures, to sustain our people, where food was totally shared. I doubt your parents charged you room and board. Um, and, uh, you know, this is an economy that's based on reciprocity, gifting, mutual exchange, love. And interestingly, I would actually argue that as a university professor, I'm still part of that economy. I'm not giving this presentation because I'm getting paid additional to do it. I'm doing it because it's the right thing to do. You know, I, I guest lectured in Sam's class yesterday because it's the right thing to do. I would say at least half of my work uh, reviewing other people's articles, publishing more than I need to or whatever, is done because I think it's the right thing to do, not because I get money for it. So we also obviously have the market economy, and that really plays an important role. And I'm going to talk about the role of market economies in food. We also have a uh, public purpose economy, which is the you know governments and NGOs and things that are focused on collective benefits that markets are notoriously poor at providing. Um, what I think is desperately missing is an ecological economy, an economy that looks at humans as part of the intact ecosystem that sustains us all. And we need to develop those economic institutions to manage our relationship with the rest of nature. I'm not going to focus on that particularly today, but maybe mention it again at the end. So um, uh, again, as I said, I'm really interested in essential resources. These are things required for human survival, which means there's no substitute. So it's what economics have to get right. Um, and oh, I should just say, you know, the economic I'm showing here, um, you know, food, energy, uh, ecosystem services, water, knowledge, all of these things are essential, no production without them, no life without them. Um, and as you all know, you've all seen these planetary boundary studies, which show, you know, novel entities, largely pesticides, uh, um, you know, so the greatest source of that is agriculture. The greatest source of phosphorus and nitrogen is agriculture. Uh, huge, the greatest threat to biodiversity is agriculture major contributor to climate change, major threat to the land system change, major user of fresh waters. So the basic point being that our agricultural system, the most important sector of the economy, is also the greatest threat to the global ecosystems we all depend on for our survival. So getting food right is doubly important. Um, so what, what defines an essential resource is there are thresholds involved. If you don't get enough some dire outcomes occur. So a physiological threshold, you don't get enough food, you don't get enough water, you cross from being living to being dead. That's just about as abrupt and serious a threshold as there is. Ecological thresholds also occur. If we depend on an ecosystem for creating the conditions necessary for our survival, then that is an essential uh, resource as well. And you have examples like right now, what's being discussed widely is the Amazon rainforest. When you get these torrential downforce of rain on the forest, it you know comes into the mist, falls into the ground, is nicely aerated because of all the roots, gets absorbed, then evapotranspires through the trees and off the trees, creates clouds and recycles rain. When you chop down some of the forest, the rain falls on bare soil, it becomes compacted, it flows off into the river, leaves the system, and your system stops being, it loses the capacity to recycle as much rain. And this is what's in the news right now, that the Amazon has become a net sink of carbon dioxide. As it gets drier and drier, it burns more and more, it uh, create, makes, can, makes it impossible in some areas for the forest to reproduce itself. And now they're saying that major swaths of the Amazon may be converting to an entirely new system state. Like a savanna. So these are, you know, the uh, the ecological and social thresholds. Um, we're I'm talking about physiological thresholds. So here I'm going to present a demand curve for food based on physiological need. 
So this is about use value. What's the benefits actually derived? Not excuse, is the same for exchange value. How much going to get selling this? This is based on the use for it. Um, and this is the marginal contribution to welfare. So when people are consuming huge amounts of calories per person, you know, USA, 3,750 calories per person per day, um, that's, uh, that's rich people, you know, and their marginal benefit from food is vanishingly small. You could actually argue that it's probably negative. You know, they're worse off by consuming that much. But as as we consume less and less food, we reach a point where there's food security. When you're below food security, you know, there's some days you might not have enough food. The marginal value of food goes up. You stop having enough food to give you the energy you need to work. You stop having enough food to give your kids what they need to develop. You start becoming malnourished and deprived, and you hit this critical physiological threshold at starvation. So the poor are often in this area, and then the destitute don't even have enough to survive. So this is physiological need. And I'm going to compare this later to a market demand curve, which is very different. We're also talking about ecological thresholds. And when uh, a supply curve is considered the marginal cost in economics, it's you know what it costs to produce another unit. And it really has to sum together all the costs. So labor and capital, which economists typically talk about, but biodiversity loss, nitrogen, climate change, all those planetary thresholds. And as we approach those planetary boundaries, as we risk catastrophic change, the marginal value is becoming immeasurably large. Because, you know, once we cross that planetary boundary of runaway climate change, that additional increment in, uh, or, you know, or the loss of the Amazon, that additional area cleared, threatens to take us into a totally different state that's past the threshold. And, you know, if you take that planetary boundaries literature seriously, we're over here. You know, we, agriculture has pushed us past the planetary boundaries. And at the same time, I should mention, in terms of 850 million people who don't get enough to eat, uh, they're over here. So we're, you know, we've exceed, we, we have yet to provide the social foundations that are necessary, and yet we've exceeded the planetary boundaries um, with our agricultural system. So, and this is the elegant way of showing that um, by Kate Rayworth, showing that, you know, we don't have enough food to meet people's basic needs, yet we've exceeded these planetary boundaries. Where we need to be is, is in this circle. And what I'm showing here is a supply curve uh, the demand curve would be over here. Supply and demand curves don't intersect. That means we're failing here and here. This donut would be where your supply and demand curves intersected if we could shift them. And that's one of the things that um, that's implicit in this talk, how we would shift those. Um, so I'm going to start out talking about food is a commodity. And I should say, feel free to interrupt anytime. I tend to talk fast when I slow down, whatever. Um, but food, so the goal in economics, what, what economists tell us is we have this, the market system through the price mechanism, uh, maximizes utility. And it does this on the production side. The markets allocates all resources to those who are able to pay the most for them because they can add the most value and sell them for the most. And on the consumption side, the market then allocates all those commodities to those willing to pay the most, which we say maximizes uh, the value on the production and consumption side. And when a resource becomes scarce, the price increases, which reduces consumption, creates incentive for providing greater supply, and returns to this efficient or optimal equilibrium. Because market economists, and I'm not going to go through the whole details, but say at that equilibrium point, society is a, a, an optimal location. You can't make somebody better off without making anybody else worse off. And we use GDP to measure the success of this. And I'm just going to go through this. Uh, piece by piece, uh, supply, demand, allocation, and measurement, and show that markets fail miserably on every one of these, objectively and miserably, even using mainstream economic analysis um, when it comes to food. So to begin with, we can look at the price mechanism for food, and the price mechanism, very easy, you know, price goes up, there's an incentive to plant more food. This is true, this works. Um, and in fact, in economics, and, and for essential resources, price is super sensitive to supply. So if there's a small decrease in the supply of grains from 2007 to 2008 or 2011 to 2012, the price of grain doubled and tripled. So this sends a super powerful incentive to produce more. Um, the problem is there's a time lag of at least a growing season. In the case of apples, for example, maybe a five-year time lag between the time you plant and the time you get the outcome. And as people who have read Danella Meadows and her leverage points for uh, um, uh, changing complex systems knows, uh, 
a negative feedback loop, which is this higher prices, increasing supply, lowering prices, uh, is broken when there's a long time lag. And we're dealing with a very long time lag. So this, this feedback loop is broken, um, you know, according to what uh, system scientists tell us. And the other point is that the ecological costs are ignored. You know, all those costs are not reflected in the supply curve. We're simply ignoring those, which is why we're going well past planetary boundaries. And the basic idea is those ecological costs are primarily public goods that affect everybody. And my suffering from climate change doesn't leave less for any of you. So these are public goods and markets are, it's, it's just taken as a given, the markets fail to allocate public goods. So markets fail to manage these problems. Um, and, you know, so essentially on the supply side, the price mechanism is broken. It's not doing what it's supposed to do. Um, so we can go to the demand side. And so there's this idea of inelastic demand, which basically means, you know, how much is your demand for food affected by the price of food? You know, price of food goes up. You don't get less hungry. Your nutritional requirements don't change. Your physiological demand is identical. And your market demand, if you are wealthy enough, is totally unchanged. When the price of wheat tripled from 2007 to 2008, Americans did not reduce consumption at all and continued actually to throw 40% of our food into the garbage, despite that massive price signal. And so this is one of the things with inelastic demand for essential resources, the demand function, uh, you know, I still am going to eat whatever the price, if I can afford it. Um, so demand is really, really insensitive to price. And this is why price is highly sensitive to supply. A small drop in supply, we just, rich people just bid up the price. So we see prices doubling or tripling of food for small decreases in quantity. Um, and you can just see these are, you know, prices over time. And you see, you know, 100% variation or more is pretty common. Um, and it's just, uh, you know, it's notoriously uh, susceptible. And this leads to wild instability for producers and consumers. Farmers don't know what their income is going to be. Producers don't know what they're going to pay for food. It's problematic. It's not ideal. Um, and so the thing about inelastic demand is we have, look at this, how the market demand curve works. So before I had marginal value, how much does this benefit a person? Now I'm focused on price. And so when I'm focused on price, when prices are very, very low, the poor can afford to eat. As prices go up, the poor are essentially excluded from the market. When the price of wheat tripled um, and or doubled in 2007 to 2000 or 2011, 2012, you know, people in poor countries ate much less. This is what drove the uh, baker in Tunisia to lay himself on fire, protest over rising prices. We didn't even notice. Not a single person in this room ate one slice of bread left less in 2011 and 2012. We didn't notice that price signal at all, um, but poor people really do, which is one of the things about inelastic demand. There's two determinants. I have inelastic demand if the resource is essential and there's no substitutes, but if I can't afford it, my demand becomes elastic. So Americans spend 6.7% of their income on food for home consumption. Uh, Tanzanians spend 50% on the food for home consumption. We're buying primarily processed food. We're mostly paying for the processing. They're mostly paying for the raw grains. The price of the raw grain doubles. They have to slash consumption. So markets, um, and I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll get back to that. But the difference here is what I showed is poor people can eat when prices are low. Middle class can eat through a wide range of prices. And the rich can eat when the market price gets extremely high. This is the exact opposite of marginal utility, where I showed the benefits were extremely low for the rich. Um, but this is how markets allocate resources to those able and willing to pay. So markets weight preferences by purchasing power. And I don't mean to be stereotyping, you know, I've been accused of stereotyping for showing an image of, uh, you know, uh, starving black children. But the fact is, due to our colonialist history and our, you know, the um, racism and uh, exploitation where you do find the hungriest people are in Africa and South Asia. Um, and they have very low purchasing power. And so their dire need weighted by low purchasing power means they get no food. And the obese Americans weighted by their high purchasing power get the food, even if they're throwing it in the garbage. So it's markets with preferences by purchasing power. And when there's enough inequality, purchasing power just dominates preferences. And this is an example of that. So I did an econometric study 
where we estimated the elasticity of demand for food for all the countries in the world. Elasticity of demand tells you by how much do you reduce consumption in response to a 1% increase in price. And this blue dot tells you per capita caloric consumption. And the orange dot tells you by how much people reduce consumption in response to a 1% increase in price. So we see that the poorest people in a market system slash consumption when prices go up, the rich people don't even notice, meaning that markets systematically allocate food to those who need it least. And this is something that I thought was, wow, you know, we've got to get this message out in economics. And then I saw the 1948 textbook by Paul Samuelson in economics. He says, you may know that Rockefeller feeds his dog every morning, feeds milk to his dog every morning, which could be used to save, you know, malnourished children from rickets in New York. Is that a market failure? No, that's the market doing exactly what it's intended to do, allocating resources to those able to pay for them. So that used to be explicit in textbooks. Now I think any textbook that had that would be banned. Um, but I, that is the case we have. So uh, the other finally thing, so basically I've tried to show that markets fail on the supply side, the demand side, the allocation side, and now the measurement side. And this is one of the things that it's, it's um, an, a resource with inelastic demand is defined by the fact that revenue moves in the opposite direction from supply. So if we're producing 2,700 calories per person per day, price is fairly low for food. And this area here tells you the price times quantity, which is the contribution to GDP. When you reduce output, and it's actually far more dramatic than this, it would, if that big a uh, drop in prices would, uh, in output would lead to prices going way, way higher. But I'm just showing this conceptually. When output goes down, the revenue and contribution to GDP goes up. So we have a measure of economic welfare that perversely responds to the abundance of essential resources. The fewer essential resources you have, the more your economic welfare increases. That's absolutely insane. So this is just a totally flawed measure. So these are the reasons why food as a commodity is really problematic. And this is the other thing that, you know, for an individual farmer, the more each farmer produces, the more they earn. But for all farmers together, the more they produce, the less they earn. Um, so this is how, you know, GDP contributes, can, uh, contributes to GDP is inversely correlated with output and too much output harms farmers, too little output harms eaters. It's a very problematic system. So now we want to look as an option at the commons. And so the commons can be defined in many, many ways. The commons is really not about resources. So this, I mislabel this. So um, the commons is, is resources that are or should be commonly owned for reasons of justice, sustainability, or efficiency. But the commons is not about the resources. It's about the way we collectively manage those resources. It's social structures that organize how resources are, you know, who owns them, how they're used. And so I would argue some things that belong in the commons are like resources created by nature or society as a whole. So all those global ecosystem services, they seem to be managed, they need to be managed collectively. Resources created by society as a whole includes culture, knowledge, um, and, uh, you know, a habitable planet would be part of the nature thing. And then some resources that aren't depleted by use, it's stupid to ration access for the price mechanism. If my use doesn't leave less for others, if it's knowledge, my use improves it. So the stupidest thing we can ration is access to knowledge. And I won't go into the fact that UVM spends $500,000 a year trying to get intellectual property rights from which we earn $400,000 in profits, meaning that we sacrifice $100,000 a year of tuition and state money to deny people access to the knowledge we generate for the public good. Um, but. I'll leave that aside. Um, so to begin with, the easiest part of the commons to understand, I think, for food is the knowledge commons, is all the, the agricultural knowledge. So how many people do you think were required to produce your breakfast? And this is not just to actually grow the food and get it to your table, but to develop all the knowledge required to do that. You know, so if you think about this, to develop the knowledge of, so first of all, we need to know about soils and seeds and biology, and then we need to know about metallurgy and, uh, you know, fossil fuels and rubber and glass to do the tractors, and then we need to do the internal combustion engines and the food processing. I mean, this is an immense web of knowledge that was produced by uh, billions of people over thousands of years, 
and no individual makes a meaningful contribution. You can actually see throughout history when a new uh, a new technological innovation or something emerges or a new scientific breakthrough, they typically appear at various places around the planet at the same time because science has reached that point where it's going to appear. Um, and so, you know, so the idea of giving the rights to some individual to own that is just wildly unjust and also idiotic because knowledge improves through use. So if I have the knowledge and I don't let you use it, you know, if I develop a way to sustainably grow food in drought conditions and then I don't share it, it's less valuable. Um, so, uh, and the raw materials for agriculture, you know, the genetics, all this, that was produced by nature, should belong to everybody, which makes private property rights are just inherently unjust for the agricultural knowledge. And they have an extreme example of this. So Teo Sinte, the ancestor of modern corn for 3,500 years, the Mexicans, uh, you know, bred and Teo Sinte to create this marvelous variety of, you know, really useful food, easy to grow. Um, and uh, then Monsanto comes in and in three months genetically modifies it and says, this now belongs to us. You're 3,500 years of labor, you know, no, you want that corn now, you got to buy it from us because we just put three months of work into it. So it's, a, you know, just a grossly unfair system. But now I want to get into the nature of, okay, so production, that's easy. We can, you know, or, I'm sorry, not the production, but the, um, the knowledge part is easy. Now the more challenging part is, you know, how do we allocate food, which is currently through markets? And I want to look at an efficient food system. So economists define efficiency as maximizing monetary value. It's more efficient to sell a loaf of bread to the overfed American is going to throw 40% in the garbage than it is to sell it to the destitute mother who wants to feed her children if that American is going to pay more. That's contributes more to GDP. That's the market doing its thing. Um, but ecological economists, you know, efficiency in general is achieving the goal at the lowest cost. Ecological economists, the goal is food security for all. We don't care about money. We care about real things. We care about meeting real needs. Um, and the cost, we look at a monetary cost, which is um, currently 6.7% of US GDP, which mostly goes to the middlemen. But the real cost are the ecological costs, these planetary boundaries, you know, that these are what matter. Um, and so, the, you know, we, what we need to do is develop a food system that provides food security for all at the lowest ecological cost. Um, and, uh, um, and allocates food, actually, to those who value it the most is kind of the goal, but value in physiological terms. So historically, you know, people say, oh, food commons, that's most of human history. Food was shared in common. Um, and groups would bring home food, it would be shared equally to everybody. It was considered um, essentially sociopathic to keep food for yourself and not share it with the community. And if you were caught doing that, you might be ostracized, expelled from the community. And there's tons of stories about, you know, the hunters just uh, downplaying what they bring in and everything is shared. Um, and I want to make the case that this is an incredibly efficient system. Um, so first of all, in all of these societies, very well, and there's, I'm not saying all uh, pre-agricultural societies were like this. There was a lot of diversity. I'm saying this was a very dominant theme. Um, but no one starved unless everyone starved. So you're all in it together. Um, and this thing about, you know, eating alone is considered sociopathic. But if you think about it, you know, the hunter comes back with an elk. It's a huge amount of food. And, you know, through a lot of hard work, the hunter could smoke it and prepare it and store it, but then would probably still lose some to scavengers or still lose some to pests. The other option is to add this huge amount of food. It'll be an enormous chore to preserve, very little extra benefit to me. But if I give it to the people who don't have enough, for them, it's, you know, this amazing, um, life-sustaining gift. So what you have is a system in which somebody gives up a very small amount of value to transfer an immense amount of value to somebody else. And, um, and uh, you know, so this is, this is the system we have. And each economic transaction, so reciprocity is considered a clickware response in humans. It's automatic. I work with an anthropologist who says in the uh, communities he works with, the Cree, it's ontological. They don't even understand, they consider it the nature of being. They don't even understand how you could not reciprocate. And this is what happens with humans, that this person gives an immensely valuable gift to somebody else who then looks for an opportunity to reciprocate. And this means that every economic transaction is maximizing social welfare and strengthening social ties. 
Contrast that with going to Hannaford's or the city market, buying a bag of food, walking out, your monetary transaction ends. That's over there. There's no developing of social ties. You don't write thank you notes. It's, it's kind of over and done with there. So it's a really radically different system. Um, and we behave very differently. So in this core economy, um, this is uh, Rockwell's um, freedom from want. And it was one of uh, uh, FDR's four proposed freedoms, you know, freedom of worship, but freedom from want, making sure everybody's basic needs are met. I, I, I think of it as um, secure sufficiency. And, I, and But in this world here, which he used to depict it, this is that sharing economy. This is not the market economy. This is that, uh, you know, a friendship and love and where fairness is the goal. And if you are in this sharing economy, if you're, you know, with your community, your friends, you're all in this sharing economy in some places. If somebody gives you like um, a wonderfully thoughtful, meaningful present and you gave them some little rinky dink piece of crap, you feel terrible. And, you know, you really want to reciprocate. And that's because this economy is based on fairness and love and caring. On the other hand, you go to the store and you see, oh, man, there's that ski jacket I wanted that's 80% off. This rocks. You buy it. You're really happy. You know nobody could have produced that coat for that price. You, somebody was exploiting the production. You know, natural resources, there's pollution. There, there is no way that coat reflects all the costs. But you're happy. Like I have my cell phone, some poor kid, like, uh, you know, the condo mine the minerals for that. And I'm happy to exploit somebody through the market. But we would never do that through the core economy. Radically different systems. Um, so the deal is, you know, we had this food was shared when people lived in small groups of 150 to 200 people, which is known as Dunbar's number. The primate brain is capable of developing uh relationships with the size that depend on the size of the brain. So, you know, capuchin monkeys have a smaller group, chimpanzees bigger group, humans have the biggest group of 150 to 200. And that is the setting in which reciprocity occurred. I can track if people are cooperators or defectors, I can track reciprocity in a group that size. That's where you can emerge this uh, reciprocity gifting uh, food commons, but we don't have that anymore. We're in a country of 300 million, 360 million or whatever. So the question is, how do we scale up the food commons? And I think the simplest idea, you know, Bernie Sanders is talking about uh, Medicare for all. That's 19% of GDP in our healthcare system. Our food system, um, you know, right now, food for home consumption is 6.7%. If we fed everybody in the country the USDA thrifty diet, that'd be 1.2% of GDP. GDP growing at 3% per year, we're saying, you know, if we... Or, you know, so by, if we just burn 1.2% of our GDP, we have our standard of living where we were five months ago. You know, would that be an unacceptable sacrifice to end hunger in America? It seems like this would be a really low cost thing. Also, with food deserts, if everybody had the right to buy food, then everybody, everywhere there is, there's a market for healthy food because the thrifty food diet is a healthy diet. But my point from earlier is that this would not be the true cost of food because the true cost of food is all that ecological harm that's been done. That's what needs to be addressed. Um, and uh, so what we really need is um, a diet with the lowest ecological impact. Um, and, you know, corn, you get almost 8,000 pounds an acre actually right now for corn, but super chemical intensive, bare soil for six months, you have tilling, really, really harmful to the environment. It takes about six to 20 pounds of corn to get a pound of beef in finishing stage. Um, so it's not every pound of beef because a lot of it's on grass, but that takes a lot of land. You can replace this chestnuts have almost the same uh, food value as corn. And you can get, you know, 2,200 to 5,500 pounds per acre. You have an understory with like hazelnuts and pawpaws. There's no bare soil. There's no tilling. Wildly more sustainable. Sequesters carbon. And then walnuts actually produce almost 6,000 pounds per acre. Um, and has pretty much the nutrient profile of meat. A little bit fattier, but good fat. And a little bit less protein, but good protein. So, um, so what we really need to do is a diet with the lowest ecological impact. And one of my... Uh, I'm advising a student right now who is calculating what it would cost, there's the minimum cost we could feed everybody, an uh, ecologically and physiologically optimal diet. Um, so right, I have another project that's related to this on urban agroecology. And lawns are the largest irrigated crop in America. 
And the goal of this is to replace turf grass and lawns with perennial dominant agroecosystems agro that provide food, provide ecosystem services, and eliminates all those, you know, lawn mowers and lawn care and all that. Um, and the idea here is we are saying the yard really, this is not a technical solution. This is saying we need to rethink, or, you know, we're gonna, we need to manage yards for the common good. For social and ecological benefits. It means rethinking our relationships to property, to society, and to nature, and really thinking of these things more as a commons. And, um, and one of the things with this, and this is an example, um, so last year, I just really quickly threw down some cardboard, dumped some uh, compost on it for my neighbor, and grew 460 pounds of squash. And so, and other years, I have these surplus of cherries or surplus of grapes. So what happens? What do you do with all that? Zero marginal value to me. Um, I share it with people. And now my neighbors bring me like, you know, sourdough bread and all these things. And just, and it, it really starts so we can get going again with that reciprocity and gifting economy. It's one of our goals. If we really start planting out a lot of the lawns, everybody's going to bump across in something. You share it with each other. It just changes the nature of the food system dramatically. Um, so, uh, you know, just really quick conclusions because my time is up. Um, you know, so the reciprocity gifting economy is thriving. I would say for the last 50 years, we've been trying to force everything into the market economy as though that's the only option. We don't even, we're not even aware of the fact that the core economy, the most important sector of our economy is totally divorced from the market. Um, and, you know, markets, just the, the fact that they allocate the, the most important resources to those who need them least, in my view, is enough to reject the market solution. And I think the commons is a really promising alternative. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it's more efficient, just and sustainable. And the way I see it is kind of the thin edge of the wedge. Um, I don't really trust revolutionarily redesigning the whole economy. I think we should be plucking knowledge out of the monetary sector, putting into the commons, plucking food out, uh, and then gradually building up the uh, knowledge and approaches to start managing um, the global ecological commons collectively, um, which also I think we need to think about the reciprocity and gifting relationship with nature rather than the exploitation getting the most bang for your buck that we currently have. So um, I hope I left time a little over, but not too bad. There's one. We have about 35 minutes.